Good to see everyone this morning. For those of you I've not had the honor of meeting yet, my name is David Decker. I'm the director of the Georgia School of Preaching and Biblical Studies. I'm honored to be here today to fill in for Brother William Howard and honored to have Brother Jesse Phillips and his wife Tracy with us. Brother Jesse will be preaching at the worship hour. Uh, Brother Jesse has been a student of our school in the past and ha has opportunities or has had opportunities in the past till COVID came to do some speaking. So we want to try to get him back into that. Brother Jesse has worked long and hard on his lessons. So we look forward to the word of God from my brother this morning at the worship hour at 1030. Let's bow together in prayer as we begin our class. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the good rest of the night and for blessing us with this beautiful new day. We're thankful for the time we have this morning to study your word and then later to worship you in spirit and in truth. We're thankful for those who have gathered and pray that you would bless every congregation of your people throughout the world who are worshiping you this morning and bringing praise and honor and glory to your name. We're thankful for this congregation, for the work that it does in this area and pray that you would bless each one as they serve you every day. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus, whose name we pray. Amen. Please get your Bibles, if you have them, and I assume you do, and turn with me to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. We will be examining one of the three beautiful parables in Luke 15 during our class time this morning. If I had to put a title on what we're going to talk about this morning, it would be The Day a Prodigal Came Home. The Day a Prodigal Came Home. Back in the late 1960s and early 1970s, the Pepsi Cola Company uh, came up with an advertising campaign to compete with their uh, nemesis, Coca Cola. And the and Brother Jesse, you and Sister Tracy have heard this sermon before, so just pretend that you haven't. <laughs> you know, one of the things about the Word of God, we may hear it a thousand times, but it's just as good the next time as it was the last time because it's the Word of God. Anyway, Pepsi Cola Company came up with a slogan in this advertising campaign, and it was entitled, Come Alive, You Are in the Pepsi Generation. It was mainly aimed at young people. So... That, you could hear that phrase on television, you saw it in magazines, it was everywhere. Come alive, you're in the Pepsi generation. That phrase worked well in this country in the marketing that Pepsi did, but when they sent it over to Asia, particularly to China and to Japan and other Asian countries, it didn't work so well because they didn't do the translating work in a complete way. So when they sent that phrase over in their ad campaign, come alive, you're in the Pepsi generation, the way those people understood it was, Pepsi-Cola brings your dead ancestors back from the grave. <laughs> well, that's not at all what they meant. That's not that at all the idea they wanted to convey. And, and that shows the power of words, words in their proper context. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 10, Paul says that no language is without meaning or significance. And he's speaking there in the context of tongue speaking. And what he's trying to show to the church at Corinth is that you can't just babble on with the mouth and call it tongue speaking and it be genuine and authentic where God is concerned. That language has to have some sort of intrinsic meaning. Just like all the languages that were spoken on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, each one of them had meaning to those who understood that language, just like English does to those of us who are here this morning. And so words have a powerful meaning. And sometimes we'll hear Bible lessons or we'll sing hymns or something and we'll hear a term a lot and then for some reason we never grasp really what it means and that's really the essence of where I want to go this morning with the parable we're going to look at in Luke 15. Some of you may be familiar with this hymn. For years I have sat in worship services since I was a boy and sang a hymn, one of the lines of one of the verses, God is calling the prodigal come without delay. Some of you may be familiar with that hymn. I sang that song for years in worship with my parents and others, and I never ever understood totally what the word prodigal meant. Really didn't have a deep understanding or connection with what that word meant. 
it, in the Greek, it is the word asotos, and it literally means reckless. If you know someone who's been convicted of reckless driving, and you know what got them convicted, then you understand prodigal. It's the idea of wasteful or living one's life in a reckless way. Well, that word is used one time in all the New Testament, a sotos. And we'll see it this morning in Luke chapter 15. Because these three parables have to do with how God feels about losing that which belongs to him. I don't know of anyone who loves losing anything other than weight that belongs to them. If you have something you cherish, the last thing you want to do is wake up one morning and realize you have lost it. Well, God is the same way. In John 6 and verse 39, Jesus said, This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up in the last day. That's God's will. That's Jesus' will. Although some of those things, some of those people will be lost, that's not the will of the Lord. John 17, 12, Jesus said in his prayer to the Father, speaking of the apostles and his disciples, Father, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I've kept, and listen to him, none of them is lost, except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be, might be fulfilled. When Jesus taught the word, and those who heard it, and they obeyed it, they became the children of God. They became born again of the water and spirit, John 3, 1 to 10, when they obeyed the gospel. And I don't know of any parent, even they, though they might become frustrated with their children at some point in time, I don't know any parent that stands anywhere or sits anywhere and says, you know, I really wish that child would leave and never come back. As we read through the scriptures and we read about Job's ten children, remember? How Satan attacked him all in one day. Several things happened. The third of those things was ten of his children died when a storm came and flattened the place where they were. How many of those children could Job do without? He grieved for all ten of them because he didn't want to lose his children. When Absalom, the son of David, who had been David's adversary, was killed, David wept over him. Oh, Absalom, Absalom, how I would that I had died for you. David grieved over that because he didn't want to lose his son. When Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, came to Jesus and begged him to come and heal his daughter or raise her from the dead, he did so because of his love for that child and not wanting to lose that child. So we, we understand that as human beings and especially those who are parents. You understand that? Well, if we understand that, then we can understand the heart of God. That when someone becomes his child, he doesn't want to lose that person. And his desire is for that person to always remain faithful to him and never become a prodigal. But sometimes people do. These three parables, the parable of the lost sheep, in Luke 15, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son, again, illustrate how God feels about losing something. The first parable, the parable of the lost sheep, could be said to show that God doesn't want to lose that which is his because it is his investment. He pictures a shepherd who has 100 sheep, keeps the 99, but one is lost. What does he do? He goes and looks for it. Why? Because to him, that flock is his investment. It's his livelihood. And he loses, even one of them, he loses on his investment. He's put time, he's put protection, he's put, he's put nourishment, a whole number of things into that flock. And if he loses, then he's lost on his investment. And it, isn't it ironic? We invest in things, stocks, bonds, whatever it is, God invests in people. That's his investment. The second parable has to do with a woman who had ten coins. Each one of those coins was the drachma in their culture, as the word is used in the text, which was a day's wage. Figure up in your own paycheck what a day's wage is. How would you feel if you lost it? Would you go look for it? If it was a, a coin or a wad of money, would you go look? Sure you would. Why? Because, number two, that 
not just an investment, that coin to you has value. It has value. Well, God doesn't want to lose his children because to him we have value. Matter of fact, Jesus even said, are you of not more value than many sparrows? And the Lord knows when even one of those falls to the ground. That's what Jesus said. So God doesn't want to lose us because we are his investors. He's invested the most precious thing to him, his son, in us. He doesn't want to lose us because we have the value to him. We're made in his image, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. So, so we have value to him. We mean something to him. But then the third parable is to lose us. God doesn't want to lose us, not just because we're like cattle or currency, not just because we're an investment or have value, but because of relationship. Because of relationship. Let's read that third parable together, beginning in verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods, remember that word, we'll come back to it, that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Remember that word in association with the word goods. We'll talk about that in just a minute. He divided to them his livelihood. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions, and there's that word, with prodigal living. It's a New King James translation. Wasteful, reckless living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Then he arose and came to his father. When he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just what he has rehearsed. In the but the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Before going any further, if you ever run across someone who says it's impossible for you to be lost after having been saved, you know, once saved, always saved, take them to verse 24. That refutes it like nothing else I know. And it's even said a second time later on in verse 32. This man was a son. And when he left home and became a prodigal, to his father, he was dead. To his father, he was lost while he was in that far country. That refutes the idea of once saved, always saved, better than anything I know. And it's right here in Luke 15. They began to be merry. And his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come because, he, because he's received him safe and sound. Your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry. Imagine that. This brother's angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, and by the way, in, in the Aramaic that Jesus spoke and the Greek in which this is written, when that older son said to his father, Lo, it's like saying, look, disrespect, look, old man. That's the idea. So he says, look, or lo, these many years I've been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time, yet you never gave me a young goat. Contrast to the fatted calf, young goat would have fed two or three, fatted calf would have fed two or three hundred. 
So you see what the older brother's saying. You didn't even give me enough to feed two, two or three guys, and here you're throwing this big party. You never even gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends, but as soon, and no, notice he doesn't say, my brother, he said, as soon as this son of yours. He had a lot of anger in his heart, didn't he? As soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you kill the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. And here's the phrase again, for your brother, your brother was dead. And he is alive again. He was lost. Now he's found. Yes, we should celebrate. What Jesus is getting at here, the focus of this parable, there's a lot of things we're going to talk about, but it's that older brother. And here's why. You go back to verses 1 and 2 of Luke 15. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And that's when he spoke the parable to them. What they're basically saying to Jesus here in these opening two verses. You're supposed to be a rabbi. How can you eat with this trash? How can you associate with this riffraff? How can you even be in their presence? Because you're supposed to be a rabbi. This is beneath you. And Jesus is showing them, especially in this third parable, and especially by the attitude of that older son. This is who you are, scribes and Pharisees. This is your attitude, and it's wrong. It's wrong. This parable teaches a lot of things, what I want us to focus on for the rest of our time, because our time is limited. And won't it be wonderful in eternity? There won't be any bells or anything that say, okay, time to quit. We can be with the Lord for eternity, and we won't have to be in a hurry. And that'll be grand. It really will. And our looking back at this parable, I want us to examine several things, particularly three, but two by way of introduction. Number one, and let's keep in mind, this is a parable. It's not an actual event. So Jesus is concocting this as he's teaching it, as he's speaking it. But he's teaching it in such a way and, and constructing it in such a way that it is so over the top that his hearers, and he knows it. He knows they'd be sitting there going, now nobody would do this. Now, this is ridiculous. Nobody, no son would do this. We're going to talk about why in a minute. But this is a parable. But if it were real, this is the application we could make, and I believe it's intended by the Lord that we do make this application. Number one, what led this prodigal to leave home? Well, the implication is selfishness. The implication is bullheadedness that says, you know, old oh man, I don't care anything about you, but I want the portion of goods. I want this portion of stuff. The Greek word is teis usias. It literally means, I want your stuff. Just, just give me what block. I don't care anything about you. I just want your stuff. And I told you a while ago, to, we're going to contrast the term livelihood with goods. When it, then the next sentence talks about this being the old man's livelihood, there it's the word bios, which literally means life. Here's the implication. An older set of parents sometimes will spend all of their lives building a life, and when they die, the kids will sell it off just to get the money. It means nothing to them. There's no significance that it's what their parents spent their life building. They don't care. All they want's the stuff. All they want's the goods, the money. That's the same attitude. It would have been disrespectful to his father to ask this in their world. Not only to his father, but also to the village in which that family would have lived. Because if a son had done something like this, they would have had a funeral for him after he left without a body to say, he's not only dead to you, father of this son, he's dead to us. He left us for money. He left us because of his own selfishness. So what led him to leave home was looking at stuff and thinking that's more important than the relationships and the love and the community that I'm leaving 
And when he gets in this far country and the famine comes, the Bible says he joined himself to a citizen of that country, Luke 15, 15. In the Greek, it, is it literally means glued. When he was in that far country and everything kind of fell apart, he glued himself to somebody else in that country because the Bible says nobody gave him anything. He didn't have, he didn't have anything. He wasted every bit of it. And so the only option he had was to, man, i got to find somebody that can keep me alive. And so he did, and the, this farmer sent him in to his fields to feed swine with these pods. These pods were, were growths off a, a keration or tree, and, and they literally look like little, uh, the boot of an elf, if you could picture that. It comes down and curves up to a point, and, and the skin of those pods was so tough, the only creatures that could eat them were pigs, donkeys, horses, livestock. The very, very, very poorest of the poor would eat them because that's all they had. And this text said that this younger boy was so hungry that he would have filled his belly with this kind of mess. That's how bad it got and how low he sunk. Though that's not what he started out to do in the parable. And that wasn't his mind, man. Give me the stuff, I'm leaving. I remember back in the 70s when I was a young man, you know, we used to, we used to deceive ourselves into thinking, man, I can't wait till I can move out. The dumbest thing we ever entertained and we didn't even know it. Can't wait till I can move out and I can make my own decisions and I can go my own way. Yes, and you can fall flat of your face too. Psalm 73, 22. The psalmist says, Father, I was so foolish and ignorant I was like a beast before you. There it is. That's what you see here. Why? Because as 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, the minds of folks like this, the God of this age has blinded. The God of this age has blinded. When Jesus was on the cross and they crucified him, they scourged him, and he was dying. Remember what one of the last things he said was? Father, forgive them. Remember that? For they know not what they do. In other words, they're not thinking straight. Their minds have been blinded. They think this is what they need to do. But Father, forgive them because they are not thinking straight. This younger son in this parable, if it had been reality, would not have been thinking straight. And that's exactly what the devil wants us to do. He wants us to be blinded so we can rationalize that we need to do certain things when in reality it could be the worst thing we could do. And somewhere at the head of that list is leaving the church, leaving the body of Christ, walking away from the Lord, and becoming a prodigal. And I've seen so many people rationalize in their mind, you know, it would be so much better out here in the world than in the body of Christ. Let me just tell you this morning, the most dangerous place that anybody in this world can be is not in some inner city place where they, where they have drug deals and, and drive-by shootings. Day and night, that's not the most dangerous place. Most, the most dangerous place in this world somebody can be is not in the Middle East with a bunch of folks around you with a bunch of um, AK-47s ready to blow you to pieces. That's not the most dangerous place. The most dangerous place that anybody can be anywhere in this world, in this universe, is outside of Christ. Amen. Amen. That's it. And when someone leaves the fold, when they leave the body of Christ, just like we've seen here this morning in Luke 15, they become a prodigal. To God, they become dead. And it's their own deception. It's their own self-deception. It's their own selfishness and bullheadedness that's led them there. Okay, second thing, we talk about what led him to leave. What led him to come home? Why, after going this direction and, you know, dead, headstrong, going to go this direction, what led him to come home? I want you to look back at verse 17, and you'll see the key. We've already talked about it. But when he came to himself, 
when he opened his eyes and he said, what in the world have I done? And notice, in doing this, Jesus constructs this parable. This younger son doesn't go, this is my daddy's fault. You know, this is all the people I grew up around. They conditioned me to do this. I'm not at fault here. It's my environment. No. He said, I did this. This is on me. And when he came to himself, notice what he said. And I want to go back and look at that really quickly. How many of my father's hired servants, in other words, his day laborers, have bread enough and despair, and I pray for hunger. In the, in, in the Middle East, in that region, someone who had financial means usually had two segments of folks who worked for them. They had, they had servants who lived with them, a staff who lived on the compound where the family lived, and then they had hired servants, which is what he's referring to, which would be day laborers, contract laborers, that would come from their own place, work for a day's wage, and then go home. Notice what this boy said. He said, my father's hired servants, not the ones who live there all the time, but the ones that are just hired. They have bread enough and to spare, and look what I'm eating. And so he goes home, and he doesn't have a haughty attitude, and he doesn't have this mindset that says, you know, I need some more stuff. He goes home with the right attitude. He's humble, he's broken, and he's contrite. And back to this idea of, of him coming to his senses. The Bible says that here. You'll, verse 17, he came to himself. In 2 Timothy 2, I want you to listen to this. If you want to read it, that's fine. 2 Timothy 2, beginning in verse 24. The Lord tells us what our job is in helping folks like this young man, those who have lost their mind and lost their way and, and, and are not thinking straight. The Lord tells us what to do. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, and look at this, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Remember in Acts chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, that bright light on the road to Damascus shone around Saul of Tarsus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And all of a sudden, Saul of Tarsus realized, I thought this is what I ought to do. But man, this is what God is doing. And he repented and turned and served the Lord for the rest of his days. And the Bible tells us that godly sorrow produces repentance, 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 2. And James says, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know he, that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death. Notice, James is talking to brethren, James 5, 19 and 20, talking to those who are in the church. He said, if anyone among you, those in the church, wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know who he, who, he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death. We turn away from God, James 5, 19 and 20. We turn away from the truth. We become a sinner that's on the path to eternal death. So yes, the saved can be lost. So again, what led the prodigal to come home? He opened his eyes. All of a sudden, he, he woke up, and he saw where he was. He saw that wasn't the place he thought it was going to be, and he wanted to go home. Friends, it can get really bad out there in that sinful world it's a dead end street. It's an empty hole. Remember in John 21, after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and Peter and six others are kind of sitting around figuring out what to do. Peter said, I'm going fishing. But when he came back from fishing, the Lord had some fish there cooking on the shore, and he had a conversation with him about, Simon Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Peter was thinking, maybe I ought to go back to my old life. So, he went fishing that night with those six guys, fished all night long. Guess how many he caught? Zero. You know why? Because when you leave Christ and you go back to your old life, you go back to the same empty hole you came out of. That's what you do. Because it was an empty hole then, and it still is. And that's what 
Our Lord is trying to show us here in Luke 15. All right, let's talk about the final three things as we spend these last 15 minutes together. When the prodigal came home, and he had the right attitude, he was humble. He didn't, he didn't say, okay, I'm going to go home. I'm going to give you some more. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to He's not responsible for why I did this. He raised me that way. He created me. He owes me some more money. That's not what he did. He was humble and concise and ashamed of himself. And he went home with that attitude. Number one, what he found in his father. Let's go back to the text. What he found in his father. He arose and came to his father, verse 20. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. And look at this. Had compassion. And ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That's, that's Let me explain something to you about this. I'm sure you already know. His father saw him a great way off. Notice his daddy didn't go with him. He's going to crawl. I'm going to make him lick my feet before he comes back and gets anything. Is that what he did? Exactly the opposite. The Bible says, number one, he ran. In the Middle East, a father, a patriarch like this, like this daddy, Maybe he's aged, maybe he's older. Adults, grown adults in the Middle East in that day didn't run in public. It was shameful. It, it was dishonorable. It was undignified. You wouldn't run. You might walk in a stately way, but you wouldn't run. The word here, treko, is, is used in 1 Corinthians 9. It's used in Galatians 2 and Galatians 5. It's used in 2 Thessalonians 3, excuse me, and Hebrews 12. This man sprinted. That's what the word treco means. It literally means he took off running. Not he's going, well, you know. He took off running. And he doesn't care that that's not dignified in his world. The only thing that matters to him, there's my boy. There's my boy. There's my child. Man, he, let, he ran, number one. Text says he fell on his neck. He fell on his neck. If you go back to Acts chapter 20, verses 36 through 38, when the Ephesian elders had that last meeting with Paul before he went on to Rome to be crucified, he wasn't crucified. We think he was beheaded, but he went on to Rome to die for Christ. He had that last meeting with the Ephesian elders. When he finished talking to them, the Bible says they fell on his neck and kissed him. Now, this what happened is here. This is not a church hug. One of these, okay, I, I don't want to do anything wrong, so I, church, I, we call them church hugs. Man, he was all over this boy. He was bear hugging him. He was all just all over him. That's the idea here. Hugging him, just embracing him. You know, I tell my granddaughter sometimes, I could squeeze you to death. Same idea. He fell on his neck. And the term where it says he kissed him, the word in the Greek is kabikalesi. And it literally means he was kissing him, man, multiple times. That word kabikalesi is used six times in the New Testament, four in the book of Luke. And I want to share one of those with you in Luke chapter 7. In Luke chapter 7, and a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he, that is Jesus, was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing with ointment. Then in verse 44, he said, Did you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she's bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But here it is. From the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. That's the same word that's used here in Luke 15. So here you've got a son, if it indeed this had happened, it was still a parable, but you had a son who's feeding hogs. Jews didn't get near hogs. That would make you unclean, not only to go in the temple and worship, but even to go home and be a part of your family and your village. It would have made you ceremonially unclean, and you would have been cleansed by the priest to even get back in the village where you lived. Here he is, he's probably still got the stink of hogs on him if this is real, if this is actual. And his father is not going, okay, man, I can't get near you. 
you smell like a hog and you're unclean anyway. He's all over this boy and he's kissing him because you see, the only thing that matters is my boy at home. My child at home. And that's all that matters. And his compassion drove him in this parable. He's not there judgmental of his son. He's not there, you know, giving him a tongue lashing in a lecture. <laughs> he said, bring out the fatted calf. Put a ring on his hand. Put the best robe around him. And, and let's have a celebration because my son is home. That's what he found in his father. Had a man respond to the invitation one time while I was preaching in Stockbridge. And in responding to the invitation, what he did is he gave me a letter that morning. He'd been an unfaithful Christian for a long time. He said, I want to be restored. I want you to read this letter and have prayer for me. He didn't come down front that morning, so we, we read the letter, had prayer for him. And one of the elders approached me after the service was over. He said, don't you ever do that again. I said, what do you mean? He said, don't you ever let somebody just give you a letter and you read it and we pray. He's got to come down front. I said, what do you, why? He said, so we can shame him. Oh, I don't think so. Because you see, there's enough shame already in the heart of that prodigal, isn't there, when he comes home. There's enough shame. And I'm not supposed to heap shame on him if I'm his daddy. I'm supposed to forgive him and love him and help him be restored and help him get over all the guilt that's in his head over what he did. That's what he found in his father. Number two, what he found in his older brother. <laughs> exactly the opposite. Remember? We just read it a while ago. His older brother came. He was mad. The daddy wouldn't even give him a young goat for two or three. He gives this guy a fatted calf for two or three hundred. Look, old man, I did this, I did this. He's angry. And again, that's exactly who Jesus is getting at. Those in those first two verses. You know, how dare you eat with these sinners? How dare you eat with these people? And Jesus is trying to show them. You've got the wrong heart. You've got the wrong attitude. First Corinthians chapter 5, there was a man in Corinth who was committing adultery that even Gentiles wouldn't do. Paul said, rebuke him and disfellowship him if you won't quit. Deliver one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Such a one. But later in 2 Corinthians 2, evidently that disfellowshipping, that church discipline had worked. And so in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 6, Paul said this, this punishment which was inflicted by the majority church at Corinth is sufficient for such a man, so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. Paul said to the church at Corinth, first of all, you need to rebuke him, you need to disfellowship him, you need to chasten him, but now you've done that, and it's worked, and now you need to restore him and forgive him. You don't need to keep beating him up over this because you know what? He's probably beating himself up over it. You don't need to help him with that. He already has godly sorrow and remorse. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition he received from us. Okay, yes, that, that's the chastening. But verse 14, if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person, do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Shame is healthy. When it exists in the heart in the right context. And you know what's wrong with our culture today? Nobody's ashamed of anything. Folks parade up and down the street and flaunt their sin and act like that's exactly the way it ought to be and let's see you do something about it. Well, I, I saw one of these pride marches. I'm not going to call it the gay word because gay doesn't mean what they say it means but I saw one sign that said God loves you and your queerness too well the first part of that's right the second part couldn't be farther from wrong part of what needs to be restored to our culture is a shame over sin and when someone has sinned against the Lord especially if that person has been a faithful Christian shame is proper as it is administered in a godly way Yet, when Paul said that to the church at Thessalonica, he finished his thought in verse 15. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. 
That person's still our brother or our sister. And we should love them and keep that in mind. Brethren, we are so divided as a body of Christ. And I don't rejoice in that. I grieve over that and so do you. In so many ways, we're divided over race over these vaccines and what COVID has done to us. We detach because folks now, they don't come to worship anymore. They sit at home and watch it on TV. I don't find anything in the Bible that says you sacrifice every service to God and everything you do in service to God just to maintain your health. I don't see that anywhere. We don't need to be in survivalist mode. We need to be in servant mode. That's what the Lord expects of us. I'm not saying be foolish. But I am saying we don't sacrifice our service to God just because somebody gets sick doing it. We're divided in many ways as a body of Christ. We're divided over the politics. If you don't believe that, go back to the last election and see how people stood against each other in the Lord's body. If we don't maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, if we don't love one another and cherish one another in the body of Christ, how in the world can we reach out to a prodigal and say, come home to live? If this is not what it ought to be. The Lord expects us to maintain the love of Christ in the house of God, the family of God, the body of Christ. So when a prodigal looks at his sin out here and he's ashamed like this boy was, the prodigal says, you know what? There's where I need to be. If we're fussing and fighting and against each other as adversaries, he's not going to have the motivation to do that. Why should I go home to that? Because that's no different than where I am right now. You don't see that here. This older brother didn't prevail. Thankfully, the father did. And then thirdly and finally this morning as we end our class, we've already seen what he found in his father and what he found in his older brother. You know what he found in the angels of heaven? According to those first two parables in this chapter, joy. The angels in heaven rejoice that this prodigal came home just like they do every time. And it doesn't take a hundred to do that. They rejoice over one sinner who repents. That's the beauty of Christ's love, the beauty of God's love. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Just like the eunuch went on his way rejoicing after his conversion, just like the Philippian jailer that Brother Jesse is going to talk about this morning in Acts 16 rejoiced when he and all of his household were baptized into Christ. Joy. If somebody comes home from being a prodigal, there should be such joy among us that it's unspeakable. It's indescribable. Because I guarantee you there's that kind of joy in heaven. Now let me ask this question before we have a closing prayer and end our class. How many of you are prodigals? Well, I wouldn't be here if I was. Well, maybe, maybe not. How many of you are prodigals? I've been a prodigal. I became a Christian at age 12, really got serious about it when I was 20. So I had eight years. Being prodigal is not a good place. How many of us need to come home? And how many of us need to change our attitude toward folks who do need to come home? And to love them and accept them and forgive them and help them get right. That's what we need to do. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful that you save our souls through the blood of Jesus. We're so thankful that you're compassionate and merciful and kind and forgiving. We're thankful, Father, that you don't allow us to slide where sin is concerned. If we do not repent and do what you tell us to do with that sin, that we will give an account and pay for it in judgment and eternity. But, Father, through the blood of Jesus, we're so thankful you've provided us a way to come home like this young prodigal had in this parable. We're thankful that you provide us love and comfort and joy and acceptance and forgiveness. Those things are so precious, especially when we do wrong. This morning, Father, I, I pray and I know those who are gathered in this place pray for the prodigals they know in this congregation and maybe other places. Those who have chosen to leave the body of Christ and to go back into the world. Father, please open their eyes through your providence, we pray that you would bring something to bear in their lives that would help them wake up before their opportunity is gone. We thank you for Jesus, who has paid for our sins and paved the way for our salvation through his death, burial, and resurrection. 
And we're thankful today for the joy that we know happens every time a sinner repents. The joy among the angels, Father, and the joy in your own heart. Thank you, Father, for this assurance. And thank you for this time of study together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.